Great turnout. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes that we just want to address first of all, and that is that this is a live debate, and as a result, well, it's not live, it's televised, but uh, because it is in English and it's going out in English, if you wouldn't mind asking anything in Chinese until after the end, we've got 52 minutes, and after that, if there's anything you want to ask in Chinese, uh, you can ask the panelists at that point. A uh, couple of other things as well, mobile phones. There's one. <laughs> Um, off or obviously silent um, and uh, please also don't stand up until we finish things up if you don't mind and last thing I'll be throwing everything to the audience uh, about 20 minutes before the end so when, you know put your hand up and please stand up and say who you are and uh, which organization you represent thanks a lot Right, welcome everybody to uh, this uh, World Expo Center. I'm sure you've been here for a few days now, and uh, here in Dalian, the seafood capital of China, apparently. Now, um, yeah, um, my name is Richard Salamat, and uh, welcome to this uh, World Econ Economic Forum, uh, fifth annual meeting of new champions right here. And of course, this is one which is focusing on uh, mastering uh, quality growth. Now, that's something that many developed nations, I think, would give their eye teeth for. I think they'd want any growth of any form if they could actually get it. So if this, of course, comes with this uh, dramatic difference in the world here in Asia as well, where we are seeing growth. And uh, in fact, they have the luxury of trying to create qualitative growth rather than quantitative growth. So that's where we are at the moment with all this. And uh, we're here to discuss the global economy in flux and the view from Asia. And I'm going to start off with... Uh, Introducing everybody, uh, we've got here Zoom In, Managing Director, well, shall I say, Deputy Managing Director of the exactly. IMF. Exactly, that's important. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, then, of course, we have got... Uh, you see, the inflation rate is very high. Haido <laughs> mm. Takanada, of course, from uh, Keio University. James Turley, who's the Chairman and Chief Executive of Ernst & Young. And N.K. Singh, who's a Member of Parliament and a former Finance Secretary. I'm going to start things off with... Just asking our panelists here what they make of the question that we're posing today, and starting that is James Turley. You know, when you think about growth, um, you can't help but these days think about the sovereign debt issues that are happening in the world. And it's one of the, the sub-themes, I think, that has been all around Dalian over the last few days. And, and when I think about what's really happening, you know, I'm not an economist, unlike some of the esteemed uh, colleagues here. I just get feedback from both the biggest companies in the world and the most entrepreneurial businesses in the world from all of our clients. And what they're seeing is all of this discussion of deleveraging, all this discussion of de-risking, it's putting a real wet blanket over economic growth prospects and confidence. And so if you think about what the, the net impact is back here in Asia, I think it's very difficult because really for the first time, it's not likely that growth in China, growth in Asia is going to be external demand driven, export driven. I think what's happening in Europe, what's happening in the U.S. is really causing an acceleration of the shift here in Asia to uh, an internal consumer consumption driven ch economy. And I think that's something that China is they already anticipated, but this is coming faster than I think they thought. And so I think that's a transition that China's working through. I think overall, I think we've got to get Europe and the U.S. to, to get a real balanced solution to the problems you're dealing with. Uh, it's not just fiscal. It is very much about growth, as you said. And I think the right people are on the case. And casing. Well, you know, I have a, uh, just a couple of points to make. Uh, First, uh, let me say that uh, it's now well recognized that the new crisis has begun even before the new last crisis had ended. In a certain sense, therefore, it's like uh, Alice in Wonderland of running faster and faster to be in the same place. Uh, the second point which I wanted to make is that this whole idea of whether we are coupled or decoupled is a bit of a misnomer because we are both coupled and decoupled in varying degrees, depending on the extent to which trade constitutes a proportion of the GDP and the extent to which we are dependent on exports as a major driver of growth. Third, I think it's clearly recognized that Asia has some inherent advantages in terms of both demography, at least in some countries, what's called the demographic dividend, and the fact that the consumption remains vastly unsaturated 
and this need for high investments in infrastructure and the social sector. And this is autonomously driven, irrespective of what happens to exogenous events. Having said this, I think that my fourth point is that certainly the global scenario has an impact. It has an impact in terms of access to capital, on the cost of access to capital, on the aversion to risk and being able to garner direct foreign investment. Most importantly, the protectionist influence dampening the, the exports and also dampening the extent to which jobs can be disaggregated all over globally, adding to global employment in a manner which optimizes the overall economic benefit. So I think that Asia is not as decoupled as they would mm -hmm. like. It has some inherent in, uh, strengths of its own and has to plan for economic growth and prosperity in a climate of enveloping global uncertainty. How to be prosperous in volatile times is a challenge for the political leadership of Asia. Zoom in. Yeah, at, uh, if you're looking for the growth from Asia's perspective, so I'll say growth is good. The first point is, looking for the past two years, the region enjoyed roughly around 8% of GDP growth rate. Loss is more than 8%. This is a little bit of lower than 8%. So it's very strong. Strong consumption, strong investments, obviously. Also strong inflation rate as well which is the bad news. Now, the question is, where will the growth come from in the coming years? I think that's a concern. I agree with uh, uh, James said, uh, when advanced economy has very weak growth, and uh, so obviously they have negative impact on the region. But I would say there are more profound reason issues there. In the past two years, emerging markets have such a strong growth, which fundamentally changes the global economic structures. Last year, the first time, the emerging market and the low-income country compiled totally 47.8% PPP measure global GDP. It's the first time emerging market low-income country being shared half and half of global GDP with advanced economy. Now, the other half have a very weak GDP growth rate. And obviously, in the past five, 10 years, it's half, half percent of GDP very much depending on the growth from the advanced economy is half. So then becomes the question, how does half get the growth from internally, not depends on external demand? I think this obviously is a very big challenge. The good thing is the region understand the challenge, understand the issue. They try to use the policy, stimulate domestic consumption, we call it domestic consumption driven growth, which is a good term, but unfortunately we're not there yet. What we observed in the past two years is very much as investment-driven growth to substitute the export growth model, which is good, but investment growth, growth model will not be able to be sustainable because, number one, you create the more capacity. When ec economies are on downturns, it creates the more difficult challenges for you. And number two, you cannot invest forever. So the really challenge for, for Asia is I think the growth is good so far, but now you really have to move in from an investment-driven growth model to domestic consumption growth model. That means you need a lot of policy in terms of supply side to getting domestic consumption figured out. Yeah, I will stop here, but obviously I think we'll go into deeps later. Yeah. Uh, take another. Well, it is very important to recognize that we are now at the point of uh, kind of historic conversion in the global economy. 200 years ago, China accounted for about one third of the total GDP in the world. At that time, the share of U.S. economy was less than 2%. Now we see a completely different uh, world. But again, as was mentioned by you, uh, the emerging countries are in increasing their presence very rapidly. So con very dramatic change is happening in the scene of the, in the scene of our economy. But at the same time, we face two kinds of risks, uh, besides the natural disaster risk. We had a natural disaster, as you know. We are still struggling for recovery and reconstruction. But two risk factors I'd like to raise. That one is increasing trend of the commodity price. This is the indicating we now face this kind of negative supply shock. A typical case of a negative supply shock can be seen in the oil crisis in the 1970s. The, this will reduce in the long run potential growth rate. And also, uh, this will shift purchasing power from oil-consuming countries to oil-producing countries, creating another huge capital flow. 
this is one risk. The uh, another one, another risk is uh, the so -called, so it kind of sovereign risk, as you know. You know, understand what's happening in the United States and European countries. But very interesting in the case of the United States. Reserve, a lot of reserve of China and Japan has been financing the government deficit of the United States. This created a kind of moral hazard of policy makers. Now we face, we have to fight against this kind of risk. Let's start off with the NK and we're going to talk about uh, decoupling, as you were talking about it before. Now you say that it's perhaps somewhat of a myth. But uh, if this, if we saw the sovereign debt crisis, the anemic growth globally, if that happened 10 years ago, how would your view of Asia be different? Vastly different. <laughs> Certainly Asia is far more leveraged with the world than it was 10 years ago. Not decoupled they, then? Uh, at that time, 10 years ago, it was comparatively more decoupled than it is today. Trade as a percentage of GDP in India in the last 10 years itself has gone up from mere six, 16% to currently 34-35%. In the case of China, the figures would be higher. So, but I, I tend to agree with uh, a point with Hezio made that just as you cannot use the word coupling, decoupling with one wide paintbrush, you cannot use Asia with one wide brush to paint the whole of Asia. I mean, the dynamics of the problem in India is somewhat different than what Zhu pointed out. Currently, I think, for, and for some time, we have been a consumption-driven economy. The result has been inflationary pressures, and the most immediate proximate policy issue is managing growth, high growth, with tolerable inflation. This may be somewhat different from some other countries which need to move away from, move away from an investment-led to a consumption-driven growth. So I think that the policy paradigms need to be adapted to country-specific circumstances instead of dealing with Asia as one large lump and category. You know, Rich, real Jim, quickly, yeah. we, we move pretty quickly past the point that, that Mr. Singh made in, in his opening comments, that of demography, because I think that has a huge impact on all of this. If you, if you look at relative ages of countries, you know, some data I've seen said that by 2020, the average age here in China and the U.S. will be about the same, 36 or 37 years old. The average age in Western Europe and Japan will be about the same, 46 or 47. And what about China? And the average on well, China will be about the same as U.S., about 36 or 37. But India and the Middle East will be 26 or 27. That's why I said demographic difference. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's a huge difference when you think about a 20-year spread between Japan and Western Europe on the one hand, Middle East and India, enormous impact on ability to fund retirement, consumer-driven demand, education policy, immigration policy, big, big issues. Yeah, every time you talk about Asia, you cannot avoid the issue of the decoupling, right? And uh, a lot of the building, I very much agree with Ms. Singh's point of view. So I think uh, uh, it, it's very difficult to simplify, say, decoupling or complete, you know, uh, coupling and today because the situation is so different. The first things I will say, there's a two end. The one is a globalization, one is a decoupling. You can pick only one. You cannot say, we are globalized, but we are decoupling from the whole world. <laughs> no, you, you cannot do both, okay? Yep. I'm on the globalization side in the board. But things are, do change now. Today, roughly 46% uh, of traders within the Asian region, but Asians still export 36% to the advanced economies. So it's a very important component for the whole economies. But most of the decoupling thing, if I use the terms, is the policy side to difference. Well, you're, you're the policy paradigm guy, so tell us about your policy yes, paradigm that NK was mentioning. That's really the, the, the challenge issue, because 10 years ago, the whole world is more or less in the same policy cycle, driven by advanced economy. But today, it's a completely different. Advanced economy, in the very different credit cycle, have a, uh, has a loose monetary policy, uh, because no space for physical have to tight physical policy. And, uh, but if you're lo looking for the Asia, it's a tightening monetary policy and a neutralized physical policy. So we are in the losing cycle in the advanced economy while in the tightening cycle in the emerging market, and particularly in Asia. But so 
This is a two party cycle. I, I, I it really has a this is a very no, I, I want to get high down there because it's not had a yeah. word yet. And you know, of course, you know, this is Japan is Asia as well. Let's you know, let's not forget <laughs> that here, right? Yes, so Jap I'm talking about emerging Asia. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and these are Japanese friends. <laughs> in the, well, in the I third hope Japan world. can emerge again someday. I think. Yeah. But um, anyway, anyway. Oh well, you you discuss a lot about the demographic issue and uh, conversion from our uh, export investment oriented to consumption. Uh, driven. Yes, I completely agree with that issue. But uh, we have experienced a very difficult experience. Uh, wow. For example, also in the case of Japan, we have been uh, discussing that from export to domestic consumption, etc., etc. Consequently, now, uh, co propensity to consume in Japan is quite high, as high as that of the United States. Uh, Japan is no more the country of high savings. Why this happened? This is simply the reflection of the aging. Our government tried to do many things, but this effort was not so useful. So demography, the impact of demography is very huge in my experience also. So what happened to China from now on? So this, of course, uh, in the case of China, the, the population is huge. And the uh, working age population will start declining in about five years or so. Still, still, you have excess labor in the rural area. So the, uh, for the time being, five years, 10 years, the high growth of China will continue. Still, uh, all Asian countries, including China, but in the, in the India case, the birth rate is quite high, so the, the, it's a situation a bit di different. Uh, these Asian countries will have a serious impact from demographic change in the midterm, I think. This is an important point. Okay, Jim, you know, you talk about business in the coal face here. You've heard what the academics have to say. What do you make of it? Well, look, I just think we're in a, a very unique situation. I, when, when you look at and compare Asia, and emerging Asia especially, to Western Europe and the United States, I think you're seeing you know, very clear things being articulated in emerging Asia, and, and less clear, more policy uncertainty in some of the historically developed world. I think you're seeing very strong encouragement of entrepreneurship across emerging Asia, and I think you're seeing the entrepreneurs in many parts of Western Europe and the United States, you know, being a little bit reluctant, and, you know, because they're not sure about what the policies will be in which they will be executing. And so it's why... It sounds like a Chinese or Asian. Uh, well, I could become one if you let me. But it, it's why you're seeing hordes of cash on corporations' balance sheets the world over, because they're not sure exactly you know, what the rules of the game are going to be in some places, so they're tending to sit tight and wait for more clarity. I think it's a real sort of dynamic time. Yeah, I just want to make uh, uh, two, three very quick points. First, I entirely agree with uh, uh, Zubin that, unfortunately, in terms of the monetary cycle, uh, Asia seems to be uh, behind the monetary cycle, which the Western countries have followed. We are in a mode of tightening monetary policy whereas the rest of the world really is loosening the monetary policy. Now, how to get the policy sync is going to be a medium-term challenge. Saying, secondly, I agree with Tezio that I was the one who raised the demography issue, but let me caution that realizing that India is going to have some kind of a demographic advantage quotes in some ways, but it will be the quality of skills and the ability of these skills to match emerging demands. That requires a vastly changed approach to entire human resource development particularly in terms of inculcation of skills, if we are to really realize the advantages of demographic dividend. Right, I want to move away from this because we could talk about this forever. Let's just move to policy responses. We brought this up. Um, I was talking to an economist lately who said that uh, it seems that the way that the developed world has responded to the sovereign debt crisis, debt crisis in the US, anemic growth, is more like the way developing countries used to. And it's the developing countries which are behaving more like developed states. Zoom in. Well, in terms of crisis uh, response, it do slightly different. But one thing is in common because both emphasize on the demand side, you know, the similar package. But stimulus package also have a different components. You're absolutely right. If you're looking for the advanced economy, all the stimulus goes to aggregate demand side, goes to tax cut, goes to the, the subsidies. And all the stimulus package in the Asia, particularly in the emerging market, goes to the investments. And the outcome is obviously is very different because the $1 in investments will dealt roughly $1.6 output in GDP, and the $1 in the tax, cut, uh, tax cuts 
get roughly less than 50% of the GDP out. So you will see the very difference. And uh, I think those policy response difference also as a part of the results for today's situation. Jim, I mean, you see in the U.S., I mean, the tax debate there. And I do, and, and it's discouraging sometimes. I, I think, you know, Jumin and I were at a breakfast just yesterday, and I thought you said something that was, was very, very smart. You said that the solution to this needs to be a balance, if I've got this right, of fiscal thinking, of growth thinking, of societal and social thinking, and we really need to get that balance right. Right now, in too many places, it's hard way one way or hard way the other way, and I'm not seeing enough real focus on growth. I'm not seeing enough focus on, on unleashing entrepreneurs to do what they do best, which is build economies, build jobs, build lives, and there's a lot that can and should be done. Now, then come to the point, as Ms. Singh mentions, I absolutely agree with you. There's different way of thinking and different model of growth and different model of macro policy. I mean, obviously, you will see in most advanced economies, the whole the way of thinking still on the demand side, the aggregate demand, the Keynesian model, the classical yeah. model, right? The crisis says the classic economic model not necessarily work well today. And uh, so you need, to, you need to change that. And in, in the emerging market, it's a model is more practically toward the real uh, uh, growth, uh, toward the fiscals, and toward the investments, and not necessarily from demand side, but also emphasize on the supply side. I think that's the policy that make a huge difference today, and will be make an even big difference in the near future. Well, in my case, I have been teaching economics in university for 20 years or so. And one day, all of a sudden, I was invited to the world of politics as a minister for financial, uh, fiscal, and economic fiscal policy by former Prime Minister Koizumi. I, I found, I was in the government for six years, I found it is completely impossible for politicians, except NK, except NK, <laughs> impossible for politicians to understand supply side and finance. They always pay demand side because this is a short run effect on the people's life. And uh, well, generally speaking, economy is bad. Then social unrest goes up. Then a politician have a tendency to become populist. Then government expenditure they increased, the uh, fiscal deficit uh, they increased. Still, economy is bad. So there could it exist some kind of vicious cycle between populism and bad economy and social unrest. This is happening all over the world. As I mentioned, in the case of the United States, this kind of uh, moral hazard helped, was helped by the investment from China and Japan. And in the case of Eurozone, uh, in the case of Greece, for example, con uh, please consider, in normal countries, the currency of this kind of country will be depreciated uh, dramatically, but since this is Euro, there is no country, uh, country currency depreciation. So this moral hazard is supported by some current system so it is important to change, to tackle this issue. So the first policy no, recommendation I'm, from this session, let me finish that one, is for every politician who wants to be a good politician have to study surprise side economics. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know what's so funny is I've never taught economics and I've never been a politician. <laughs> you know, I just am operating in the real world with companies and clients and whatnot. And what they're saying in many parts of the world is they're just uncertain on what to do. They see their governments as, as somebody juggling a lot of different policy balls, all of which will impact them when these policies are finalized. It might be health care. It might be financial reform. It might be how to deal with the banks. So what you're saying is economists in the old adage have predicted no, five, five of the last two recessions. That's for sure. <laughs> but if you think about it, you know, I, and I had an entrepreneur say this very directly. I see this juggler. I know when these balls hit the table, it's going to splatter right on me. And until I know what the impact's going to be, I'm sitting tight. And so that's not a recipe for growth. Is that the problem with corporate, corporations? Are they waiting for this to happen? They're waiting for some clarity, not just on the economies, but clarity on, on how governments and societies are going to deal with some of the sovereign debt issues because of how it's going to impact them and, and their business. Oh, in this regard, I propose we should recognize there are two kinds of policies. One is policy to help. Another one is policy to solve. Solve. May you understand that? So even in the case of the Greece and the European uh, countries, uh, many are discussing policy to help. 
Yes, they are, since they are in the crisis, some help is needed, but fundamental solution is a little bit different issue, different point. And uh, so, uh, I, I, in this regard, I would like to uh, propose, so for example, you, are, you will play a very important role in the G20 conference. But in the case of G20, they are mostly discussing the risk response policy. But in case of risk management, first risk recognition is needed, then risk mitigation is needed, the final risk response comes out. So now, I understand policymakers are very, very busy now for the risk response. But besides that, with risk, risk recognition process, risk mitigation process is also needed. Well, I, I just want to say that, first I think that, Zhu, you're absolutely right that uh, on an issue which you raised earlier, that we need to take very tangible steps to improve total factor productivity of both capital and labor overall. But you can hardly do so in an environment which is becoming increasingly protectionist. And whereas I said that if the disaggregation of factors of labor and capital run contrary to the laws that Adam Smith had told us, the working of the invisible hand, then clearly you would get suboptimal economic structures coming up. And this is something which, which the policymakers need to confront. Secondly, I agree with Hezio that I think in terms of policy prescriptions, there needs to be certainly greater political understanding, to, which goes beyond mere issues of uh, overall macroeconomic stability into structural issues, on issues, for instance, of quality of life, uh, infrastructure, on health, on education. And on those, I think it will be possible for an organization like the G20, hopefully, to come up with more aggressive solutions than they have in the past. I think this issue of protectionism is really important. It's one of the real risks. Uh, Jumin said very clearly that you're one who is in favor of the globalization side of this decoupling globalization debate. I agree with you. And that means that one of the biggest barriers to that would be protectionism, whether it's trade, whether it's currency, whether it's regulatory. Oftentimes, you'll see trees almost competing in the regulatory realm. And so I think nothing can discourage growth more than some of these protectionist issues that NK's talked about. Uh, I want to move to well, one uh, topic which has really been touched upon, and that's, of, of course, the sovereign debt crisis in Europe. And I want to get your view, uh, Min, about where we are on the road to solving it, and what is your end case scenario, and how does it affect things here? Well, so many, so much talks has been yeah, but done in this area. Yeah. I think I really don't need to say too much about that. I think, uh, the whole European situation is in a uh, we call dangerous new phase. Uh, uh, the first issue is uh, we are very much concerned the whether uh, the sovereign uh, crisis were contingent to the banking sectors, where, where this is a big issue. We are also concerned whether we will be able to maintain the financial stability for the, the, the particular countries currently still relatively weak. And uh, the third issue, the most important thing that we are concerned is whether we we'll build the capacity to maintain the growth in a sustainable in the near future. So the policy is very challenging. You need to so solve the sovereign uh, issues and in the short term, but you need a sort of a policy to support the growth, as you need a structural reform to support the long term sustainable growth. And you need three things to get together there. You need a very strong political leadership to push the whole thing. We still see a way out. There's a clear way out if we can act now with decisive action. Is that the D word? word? Yeah, but the, yeah, this is very important. But uh, if we miss this opportunity, it, it can be very risky for everyone. I just want to say that uh, what Zhu Bin, uh, wishes to convey <laughs> can be conveyed somewhat to say Europe is too important to be left to Europeans. And that is why I do believe that uh, it is terrifically important for the G20. Is that what you to, meant to say? To <laughs> it, it encourage them to act with a degree of sagacity and political leadership which Europe requires because it is very important for the rest of the world of how Europe sorts itself. Jim, out. so uh, is America too important for America with then? Well, look, I think uh, all of these leading economies, including China and Asia, are too important to act alone. So, yes, I would say I agree that Europe's too important to, to be left to Europeans. The U.S. is too important to be left to the U.S. China is too important to be left to China because we all have to, to work in concert 
and really think about this in, in a collective way, or else we're going to default to protectionism. We're going to try to reverse some of the globalization, as we've been talked about, and it's not going to help any of these major geographies uh, address the future. The European crisis will have a profound impact on the region. The first issue is obvious on the trade link, because the euro area is still the number one trade exports area for the region and also for China. And number two, the financial regions, because the region still holds a lot of uh, euro-denominated assets. Number three, obviously, for the global financial systems, stability is obviously very important, because it will live all together for the one financial system. If one system breaks down, it will cause tremendous impact on everyone else, and the last not least, obviously, the confidence issues. So I agree with uh, uh, Mr. Singh mentions, and, uh, and the Europe is so important. Uh, it is a Europe issue, but it's also the global issue. But I was trying to get a sense of where you think it all ends up, and how does that then play out here? I'm going to actually ask Takan Hadassan that. Well, I'd like to raise one point. Uh, you mentioned a very important point. We now discuss a sovereign risk. You, you, we use the term sovereign. The real problem will be in the banking sector mm -hmm. in the near future. Because this uh, national bond, bond is held by the banking sector. And there are various kinds of financial crises we experienced. But among these various kinds of financial crises, banking crisis is the most serious one. In the case of the United States, the, for example, Lehman Shock. Lehman Brothers is not a bank. This is an investment bank, right? Not, not a regular bank. But in the case of European countries, the regular banks will face this kind of risk. In that regard, of course, international cooperation is, of course, needed. At the same time, very strong cooperation uh, uh, with the banking authorities' effort in each country is maybe much more important for the time being. How to coordinate the, this, uh, uh, the, the banking authorities' behavior in the region? This could be very much important topic in G20 also, I think. Jim, very quickly. Real quickly. The, one of the things you talk about Europe being too important, U.S. being too important, if Europe, U.S., and Japan don't sort things out, we're going to see a continuing acceleration of the emerging to emerging market trade, really south to south. Uh, it's not a secret that Brazil's largest trading partner, which used to be the United States, is now China. And you're seeing much more southern hemisphere trade. And if, if Western Europe and U.S. don't sort things out, I think they will increasingly be carved out of the global trade game. And so it's very, very important to get this solved. Very good point. I'm um, going to just uh, throw it out to the floor. Anybody want to ask a question here? Uh, that gentleman was first. Uh, if you just say where you're from and what your name is and who you'd like to address. My name is Sonny Lee, uh, South Korea's Korea Times. I want to ask this question to Mr. Jumin. Um, a Chinese economist told me that politicians are just human beings. Uh, yes, we all continue. <laughs> but he said economists, they have animal instincts. <laughs> they could feel an earthquake that will happen miles away, years away. So I'm you know, turning to your animal instincts about the prospect of the United States. Um, do you think the current economic slump of the United States is a long-term, permanent, downhill, irreversible process of collapse of the United States that will be lead to replaced by the rise of China, which will be the number one, while China and the United States will be number two. What does your animal instincts tell you? What does your guts tell you? Thank you. It's look like a journal journalist has the most animal instinct. <laughs> <laughs> Not an economist. And uh, the first issue is we're all human beings. And so we always have a positive and hope in our mind. I think this is the basic things for the human being. So for the U.S. economy, I would, I would say number one, I don't believe there will be a double dip. The growth is slowing down. Everyone downgrades U.S. growth rate from 3 to 3.3 down to roughly 1.5 to 1.6. But it's still more than 1.5% GDP growth rate. If you take the definition for recession, it's roughly continuously too close negative. and negative. Yeah. I don't think that will happen. And uh, yes, the uh, U.S. have a very weak uh, physical conditions. Yes, uh, uh, the debt is way high. Yes, monetary uh, policy is very loose. The space is very, very little. Yes, the political process is not very smooth. But U.S. is still, still the major 
uh, global economies, the technology and uh, also the, the growth of engines is relatively strong. And I would say the U.S. will maintain a relatively median growth rate for periods and adjust themselves. And particularly, I would say, on the supply side policy structure change and move into the median term, go back to normal growth. You know, let, let me give you a different response to that, if I can, very quickly. Um, I was with a Swedish economist, Shell Nordstrom, recently, uh, who was speaking to a number of our partners. And, and he said, some of you might think the U.S. is on the downhill slide, to your question. He said, don't believe it. He said, I'll tell you one real reason why. This was at a meeting in Europe. He said, you know, we're in, in France. He said, that France is a nation state. Germany is a nation state. We're all nation states. He said, America's not. He views it as being an idea that anyone in this room could go to America and become an American in a little while. Long story short, he went to the diversity of the talent there. He went to the fact that the way the, the U.S. operates Anybody from around the world could go, and you, if you go to Stanford University, if you go to leading universities, it's like the United Nations, both the student body and the faculty. And he said because of that, the diversity of thought that comes in here creates an, an innovation and an entrepreneurship that will always create really rejuvenation. And so he's very positive about well, it. Well, a different response which I can give you is that if you are seeking from an economist a, a uniform answer, uh, that's exaggerating because as John Kenneth Galbraith had said, that then you're almost accusing him from suffering from a lack of imagination. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Anybody else? Uh, that lady over there. Of Thank you. My name is Ting Yan from China Business News. Um, as we know, the BRICS countries are now talking about giving a hand to Europe. So my question is for all the panelists here is, um, what are the tangible ways, um, tangible steps the BRICS countries can make? And is it a good idea to buy a European bond at this moment? Thank you. Hi, uh, very quickly. I mean, uh, I think Greek bonds were two-year notes yielding 56%. So there you go. <laughs> well... First of all, well, Premier Wen uh, uh, yesterday, the day before yesterday, made a very good speech on that issue. Well, for example, that investment maybe, investment not only in treasury bond, but also in the private sectors. Uh, yes, it is uh, quite expected. And also, uh, please do not forget, invest in Japan also at that time. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, uh, if I can, uh, go a little further. First of all, I understand the question, but I want to correct the question in another way. You know, you ask whether it's a good time to buy the bonds of the Europeans. It sounds like uh, it's a market speculation. You know, whether it's a good time to buy cheap and you can earn money. No, this is not the right question and not the right answer. I think when the breakers say, say to, uh, to lend a helpful hand as a means as it's a global issue, it's a global solution. So it's really to support, to maintain the global stability, I think. It's, so it's in the sense to support rather than a simple from financial and profit sense, I think it's number one. But number two is also important. The external support, particularly for the, for, for, for the liquidity side, will not solve the issue. Because you need a domestic uh, policy, you need the inside, particularly from the restriction point of view, has a workable program to make sure you have a structural reform, two things get together, then we will be able to solve the issue. MK. Well, I just wanted to respond to the first part of your question on what the BRICS country can do. I think what they can do best is to continue to do what they have been doing, namely pursue a highly developmental-centric policy and enabling political leadership to pursue a combination of monetary, fiscal, and structural changes which can give them 8% plus rate of growth. In this way, they will be able to deal with their own issues of poverty, own issues of improving human index of human development, and become important contributors to overall global prosperity. Should they buy European bonds? <laughs> well, that one, I think that <laughs> we will all have differences of views among us. <laughs> Jim. I, I actually think that just a government issue, it's also a private sector issue, and, and I think that having both Asian companies, Indian companies, companies from around the world continue to seek business opportunities to expand their business outside their own geographies into Europe, into the United States, 
is one way to continue to support each other in a very thoughtful way, as uh, Jim had said. Gentleman here at the front. No, Matt. Thank you very much. Alessandro Magnoli Bocchi from Kuwait China Investment Company. It seems to be a consensus that some degree of suffering uh, is needed going forward, right? The solutions are at hand, but they are politically difficult. So either some debt restructuring or some restructuring of the structure of the economy, so China from exports to consumption. Um, what are your thoughts on the degree of acceptable suffering that we have to go through? Example, euro bonds are a solution, but they are not go if they, they happen tomorrow, there is no suffering. But there is also moral hazard, because they would extend very cheap credit like the euro did, and, and uh, we could fall in the same crisis in a year's time. Uh, housing sector in the U.S., some restructuring is needed, right? If, if we don't do it, the economy doesn't restart, consumption doesn't restart. But if we forgive the debt, there is moral hazard. So what is the right balance of suffering and solution going forward? But just very quickly to zoom in on this one. Thank you. This is absolutely important questions. I, I, I want to use the, 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 the concept of suffering. You have issue, you have a thesis, you have to solve it. But you've got to be very careful balance the current growth as a people's living standards and the potential long-term growth and also in the way to solve these issues. So we always, as a promoter policy, we say you have to have authority policy, media and credible policies on load, but more or less probably can be the back load, but you need a certain policy to promote the, promote the growth because it's obviously it is the growth to maintain the living standards of the people. At the end of the people is the most important thing. Is the growth reduce the, the death uh, uh, level, and is the growth to bring the financial stability? Very quickly. Okay. Well, you, pain, yes, political pain is existing in the reform. Uh, political pain means, well, there exists some vested interest group. If there is a reform, this group of people will lose a huge amount of money. However, the, the merit of this kind of reform will spread over to many people. The, the merit itself is very small. So this is quite difficult politically to persuade this best interest group. Of course, macro, from the macro side, the, the fiscal uh, contraction is needed to reduce the standard of living. But much more important, the distribution. Uh, in this process, the distribution of the income will be uh, changed. The, this process, uh, the best interest group people will do, uh, you know, do the huge profit. This, with, so politically. It, uh, uh, the political backlash will occur in this case. Gentleman there, the glasses. Well, Tolani from Tolani Shipping. Uh, I think it is generally accepted that the failure of Lehman Brothers was really a failure of regulation. And uh, I think also the behavior in the banking world in some way has uh, inspired even governments like Greece to go on a highly leveraged sort of uh, route. So, so this, this so-called failure of regulation perhaps has uh, impacted governments too. Now, we were talking, I mean, we were being told about the uncertainty that corporates face and therefore they are not moving. Could it not be that there is a certain lack of confidence in the existing continuing regulatory environment which leads even policymakers to not have any confidence in bold policy moves and therefore we have all this discussion about which, which policy will work and nobody is really making a move so need, should we not really be changing the focus to cr fix the regulation to get to a point where people can have confidence in a system when they can then move forward boldly. I want to put that to Jim because I think your industry has probably had more regulation and more regulatory changes than <laughs> well, I don't know. We, we certainly have in the last decade uh, been hit with a lot of regulation, but, uh, but our industry has actually come through quite, quite fine. Um, I actually that there is a lot of kernels of truth in, in this comment. Uh, there was a fascinating editorial in the Wall Street Journal a few days ago uh, after B of A, Bank of America, announced they were laying off 30,000 people, 
uh, commenting exactly on this, saying that if you look back to the financial crisis, largely driven by easy money, perhaps a, a crazy housing policy, as I said, and regulation, um, come through with Dodd-Frank, which doesn't address easy money, doesn't address the housing policy, but addresses a number of other things and, and starts regulating how much a bank can charge for a swipe fee in terms of, you know, for every time someone goes to Walmart or wherever else to make a purchase. And at the end of the day, commercial bank laying off 30,000 people. Uh, I think that there is a lot of truth to what you're saying. I think trying to get real sensible regulations that don't bind the hands of entrepreneurs, comment earlier about animal spirits. I think entrepreneurs have animal spirits that are being sort of caged a little bit now, and trying to get sensible regulation that encourages them to act is something that is not easy to do, but important to do. I just want to add to something that Jim said, that I entirely agree that uh, improving the overall regulatory regime is something which is inescapable. At the same time, what is a perfect regulatory regime is a somewhat illusionary question, and a lot would depend upon country-specific circumstances. Some countries require a to traverse a longer distance to improve regulation than others do. Also, I think that the danger of over-regulating as compared to under-regulating is something which policymakers must constantly keep under a dynamic surveillance. Anybody else? Okay, let me add one thing to that since there's, there's no question and uh, take another 15 seconds. Uh, I agree with you. It's clear it's a confidence issue there. That's a clear confidence of crisis. The unfinished regulatory framework reform is a part of that. But most important, the confidence crisis actually comes from the political crisis. Because the, the political leaders of the government was unable to take decisive action to bring, bring a clear end game uh, uh, proposal on the table. So if you cannot see the end of the road, obviously you don't have a confidence. I think the issue is we always say that we're in a very dangerous new phase of a crisis, but there's a way out. So we need a politician to take decisive actions to bring the end again proposal on the table, bring the confidence back, and we'll be able to get out. My point was really to stimulate thinking to get to the root cause rather than something, you know, which is thereafter. Well, since, tree, since trees are grown in different <laughs> lands, you will reach different roots. And I think that, therefore, what you require to be fixed in terms of regulation cannot be a fixed paradigm which will apply equally to all countries and circumstances. <laughs> what is here is that the key regulation which governs financial markets in the developed world is American regulation, which generally moves over to the Europe also. So I'm really pointing my finger over there. <laughs> yeah, I see that. But I think that they are still debating on whether to have a fine equilibrium between over-regulating and in terms of what Jim said, uh, kill a lot of the innovation and entrepreneurial spirit as compared to uh, preventing the kind of uh, events and, and episodes which we have recently seen. Yeah, the Lehman case, obviously, clearly is a failure of a government, a failure of a regulatory framework, and a failure of the market. But at, at, at the current uh, situation, we still see the reform, as I say, the regulatory framework is not completed yet. But the whole thing is when you need to push the political leadership. I think this is the most important thing to bring, bring the confidence back. Gentlemen, that wearing the red tie. As an as an entrepreneur planning my fiscal year for next year, how afraid should I be? <laughs> <laughs> I think Jim's got that one. Uh, Lord, I hope you're very optimistic. Um, and, and I think that you know, we, we did a survey at Ernst & Young in the depths of the financial crisis. We surveyed hundreds and hundreds of companies who are big, mature multinationals and hundreds of others who are more entrepreneurs like yourself. What was stark is the different attitudes they had. The most mature were focusing on what they had to lose, on how to protect their assets, so they hunkered down. The most entrepreneurial were saying, now might be the time for me to take risks. Now might be the time where there's an opportunity out there. Lord knows what entrepreneurs do best is they see needs out there, and there's lots of needs, 
and they have the vision to create a product or a solution to meet the need. And so I would encourage you to take those risks and, and you know, the financing will be there. You'll be able to find financing and go make it happen because there's lots of success to be had. Hi that very quickly. Well, a cautious optimism will be the most appropriate term to describe the situation. Well, we, there are the many uh, factors we should be very cautious about. At the same time, I'm not so pessimistic about the future of the global economy, especially, I believe, uh, the emerging country, the economic growth will continue, uh, even though the American U.S. economy growth rate will be go down a little bit. Uh, this is not decoupling. They are influenced to some extent, but not, this is not fatal. My regret is always in this Davos meeting, we use the term cautious optimism. <laughs> I, I will say the quick two points. And uh, the, the first one is uh, be cautious, but with hope. There's a way out. I, I firmly believe that, but be cautious. The second point is more important because the whole world experiences a very dramatic and fundamental structure change. As I mentioned, the growth gravity is moving away from the advanced economy to the emerging market. And it's not only that, whole financial movements, whole trade movements and change. We observe currently the global manufacturing reposition. The advanced economy moves to even higher uh, uh, R&D technology sections and the moving is uh, uh, capital intensive uh, chemistries, equipment uh, manufacturing, move into the emerging market. And the emerging market move into its low tech products into the low income countries. It's a massive change in the whole world. So you should catch the change, move to the new opportunities. Man, you're 100% right that, that, that growth on average is a lot higher in Asia than it is yeah. in the United States. Yeah. But there are hundreds and thousands of entrepreneurs that are growing 10, 20, 30 percent a year in the United States. We need more. Jim, thanks. Uh, last word now, uh, but just in 15 seconds or less, starting with NK Singh, what keeps you awake at night, also within the realms of decency? <laughs> well, <laughs> I think clearly every morning uh, will bring a new burst of uh, optimism, which is cautious, but agility to plan for the worst. And that keeps you up at night? <laughs> <laughs> it, it certainly acts both as a sleeping pill as well as a wake-up call. Jim. 15 seconds. Probably not letting the urgent get in the way of the really important. And for us, the really important is following the shift in capital and growth that Jew Min's talked about and following the demographic shifts that are taking place in the globe. Those two things. I well, risk and opportunities are always both sides of the coin. We now face very many risks, but at the same time, uh, around this kind of environment, new entrepreneur, new business, business, business model will be uh, emerged. So we need leadership in the government, in the business sector. From the Asia's point of view, I would say the key issue for the regions is need a change in the growth model due to the structure change. And this is a fundamental issue. If Asia cannot complete the growth model change, particularly from uh, a surprise side driven growth model change, Asia will not be able to lead. But it's not easy. In the past, we observed the success, but we observed the more failures. That's the issue really caused my concern. Zoom in, Heiko Takanada, uh, Jim Turley, NK Singh. Thank you very much. Everybody give them a hand. Eh? Now, any questions in Chinese? Uh, uh, NK Singh's got to run, but uh, anybody got any questions in Chinese uh, for the three panelists left? This lady just there. Good afternoon. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I'm, my name is Luo Qiping. Uh, just now, uh, Mr. Chen Siwei recommended that we should uh, uh, we we, sh we should uh, uh, international uh, globalize the uh, the covered bond. Uh, do you think it's a possible solution? This recommendation from Mr. Chen. Oh, too confused. Uh, so that's five minutes. 
Should I speak in English or in Chinese? In Chinese, if you'd like to, in or, or in English. The equity swap. The Mr. Chen recommended that equity swap proposal. Do you think that's a possible solution? That equity swap. This is a technical issue. First of all, do we have an international collaboration to solve international problems? Under this kind of context, we need a lot of technical solutions. To uh, we have all kinds of different options. <coughs> Can you elaborate? Oh, someone, uh, the others have the some information. Is uh, um, the debt com uh, using the share to the debt to compensate our, our debt is possible? The debt equity swap, that's the whole question, whether it's possible. This uh, um, uh, Professor Chen's raised this objection this morning. <laughs> I think we're getting a lot of res uh, lack of response here on that. Um, I think we should wrap things up, actually. So let's, uh, let's leave it at that. Let's give them another hand. Right. Sorry, that's okay, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, good guy, Shane. Thank you.